So what you've all been waiting for is the audit item um, on our agenda. So thank you for being so patient. And um, Dr. Swift, I know you'll open with some remarks. And then uh, uh, Mario Stimitro and our Plant Moran, our auditors, will be presenting as well. Um, so Dr. Swift. Well, thank you, Madam President and trustees and members of the audience. Uh, tonight we will hear the presentation of the 2017 18 annual audit and as we do every November it will be presented by our auditors from Plant Moran they are here with us this evening Laura Clays and Jennifer Chambers they served us for a number of years uh, beautifully and I appreciate their hard work uh, tonight our auditors will share a clean opinion that's not something that a lot of folks have to think about but we have to think about that is, is the district whole? Is the district um, uh, following all of the multitude of guidelines with regards to how we manage the money? I want to thank right up front Assistant Superintendent Mario Stimitriou and our CFO, Ms. Amanda Matheson, who do all of the work year round to ensure that our district uh, is fiscally sound and responsible so that when the auditors arrive, the work of the audit occurs 365 days a year, then the auditors arrive and if we've done our work properly, uh, then we come to a clean audit, which is where we are this evening. Uh, while the presentation occurs this evening, we are vigilantly monitoring our budget and that is a 365 day endeavor. We literally work on this every day. Trustees, you receive regular updates from me as to uh, the designing of new revenue streams, uh, the cutting of cost, and all of the ways that we can go about having the very best possible budget that we can. Uh, two decades ago, Michigan was ranked among the top five in the country in the funding of public education. Today, by the most recent Quality Counts report, you can Google it under Quality Counts, um, Michigan is ranked 34th in funding of public education. I never speak about the budget without sharing that fact, because when uh, the uh, state superintendent speaks about top 10 state in 10 years, and we certainly respect that vision and we want to be a top district and we work on it every day. Uh, I can't help, however, to feel the extreme disconnect in saying we will be a top 10 state for public education and we'll fund it at 34th in the country. There are examples of states over the previous five to 10 years who've made conscious decisions to do a better job for public school, and they have worked their way up on that ranking while Michigan has done the opposite. So I'm never with legislators or with the public around the budget without making that case. Public, quality public schooling is worth it. It is worth it for every child on every day, and money does matter. While it is the task of the auditors to sort out the finances of the district, to check the numbers, to pay attention to the details, it is the responsibility of the superintendent and the leadership team and the board to balance that budget. And certainly there are decisions to be made there. It is our goal to have the budget, if it's done well, will reflect our priorities in the district. It will also show our challenges. It will document our progress and our setbacks. And hopefully, a carefully considered budget can also reveal opportunities to do our work even better for students and staff. Let's think about our priorities in the district uh, as we begin to look at the audit this evening. Priority number one, teaching and learning and student achievement outcomes. I mentioned that Michigan is 34th in the country um, for uh, funding of public education. Michigan also gets a D plus 
or a C minus, depending on the year, in student achievement outcomes. Because you see, you can't really improve student achievement outcomes if you don't improve the way by which we fund public schools. So those things are connected. Priority one, it's our critical mission, teaching and learning and student achievement. Secondly, we need to ensure student success and that involves exactly the things that Fred mentioned and I heard at elementary caucus and I hear in every school I go into, that idea of our students need more support. They're coming to us, victims of trauma, second language students, students with special needs, students, uh, children of immigrants, they come with great need and we need more supports to provide for them. We also have, as the third leg of the stool, our ability as a district to attract and retain the very best teachers and staff. Our teachers have spoken eloquently to this priority this evening. Our goal is to ensure that that staff is competitively compensated. The three goals we set together as we sat at the table with, with EA leadership three years ago, three goals that our teachers would be the most caring competent and committed, that is already true. Secondly, that they would be the very best supported um, in the state. And thirdly, that they would be the very best compensated. Those are our goals, that's our mantra, and we're on that journey to ensure that that's true. We can't look at the budget this evening without thinking about one-time impacts and I remember uh, that our auditors every year speak to us about the impact of these one-time events on our budget. And so I was just walking through memory lane uh, a few weeks ago and thinking about over the recent five years, each budget has included these one-time occurrences. Some of them are because we have very thoughtfully, intentionally, and deliberately leveraged every asset we can to help build back our financial strength for the district. We've used one-time opportunities to strengthen the district, to help rebuild the fund equity. We have generated revenue in order to better compensate our staff, and at some point, one-time occurrences are just simply unexpected or surprise events. Trustees, you've heard me share the anecdote that on my first day of duty um, in, in 2013, one of the first things I was presented with was signing a line of credit so that we could make payroll that fall. That was a sobering moment that a district as successful as Ann Arbor Public Schools had to have a line of credit to ensure that we could make payroll for our September and October payroll payments. Uh, thankfully, we were able to avoid that very near um, uh, catastrophe. And yet, I'll share with you, there are many times, and you know it because I speak to you, where we do pull out a one-time event and do everything we can to ensure that payroll continues and that our budget is strong. We have helped uh, the budget by looking for these one time. You can see we've sold real estate, the, selling the interest in the library. The interest in the library was not even something that a lot of people knew we had. And yet as we searched around and brainstormed and said, how can we generate revenue? Someone in some brainstorming meeting said, what about that interest in the library? Do you suppose they would pay us for that? It took about two and a half years of a lot of heavy meetings, both with the library folks and with their board and our board. And eventually we raised $3 million out of that endeavor. Um, we revised the WISD county reimbursement process on special ed funding. I want to give credit to Mario Stimitru for this idea and for doing the work. It turned out that the WISD had more money in their special ed Act 18 uh, revenue than all of our nine county districts had in their, in their cumulative fund equity accounts, more than all of us put together. 
And so we looked at that and we made a case and it took us about a year to convince all of the superintendents, but we were able to get the vote. That raises about five and a half million in 2015 that we were able to invest back into our staff. Um, but it also, we revised that process moving forward. So trustees, you know this change has benefited us about two million a year each of the, of the years since 2015. Sometimes one, uh, un, one time events are completely unexpected and thanks to the choir teacher uh, at Pioneer, um, Mr. Stephen Lorenz, who was walking his dog on an evening in August 2016, we discovered the Allen flood before it was much worse. He was walking his dog and noticed that there was water pouring out of the front of Allen and he knew something wasn't right. So I'll always be grateful that he made the call uh, to Robin Bailey that evening. We were able to get over there and get emergency personnel over there to shut the water off. But that one time event, uh, even though our insurance, we have excellent insurance, even though it's hard for us to get insurance now, that's another story, but, um, but we, um, we were able to get good reimbursement, and yet every single line of our budget that year was bigger than it should have been. We had to transport students for about eight months. We had additional staffing and hourly pay for teachers and staff that had to do the work associated with that disaster. It was a one-time event and not a good one. Uh, two other ones, a tax base adjustment. President Stead mentioned that. That was a delightful uh, gift and blessing to us last year. I have also had years where Mr. Demetrio walks in and says we have a tax base adjustment and it's not a good one. It goes in the other direction. So we know uh, the wind blows in all directions. And then finally, uh, we have begun uh, charging folks when they ask us for an easement. Uh, we've recently dealt with one public organization, I won't name them, who won't pay us um, uh, because they have eminent domain if, if we say no. Uh, but most of these lately we've been trying to get, and Mr. Demetri has been able to get a little bit. That was about $1.2 million last year. So we see for year to year that the, the uh, one-time events do impact our budget, and yet what we know is that one-time events is not the way to balance our budget going forward. And I know that the auditors will say this, this night, uh, tonight, that every year we hear from them the caution that we cannot meet ongoing costs, payroll, et cetera, through the use of one-time income. We have done some of that because we felt so strongly that we wanted to give what, some of what we had to our staff, but we cannot do that on an ongoing basis unless we're going to be facing later on uh, a more difficult situation, uh, risking the possibility of layoffs, et cetera. So this is a reality of our fiscal responsibility, one that we've heard from our auditors and that we understand. I wanna talk just for a minute about our efforts to improve the bottom line. I often hear from folks who wonder, what have you done lately to try to improve the bottom line? That's a great question. We've been on a path for five and a half years to get at our fiscal sustainability. Uh, we've been on a mission to improve the AAPS bottom line. We're grateful to the Ann Arbor Public Schools community for their support in increasing and extending the sinking fund that was in May of 2017. And because we received the support, we are preventing now the drain on the general fund of our 60, average 65 year old buildings that have things break often. And so we're able to renew our aged infrastructure. We're only on the beginning of this 10 year project because there's a lot of things broken uh, in your classrooms and buildings, and we are on that project. But now, because of the sinking fund, we're not having to use general fund money. That frees up general fund for salaries and benefits. 
We have renewed and increased the special education millages going to our voters twice uh, in November, in May of 2016, in November of 2017. We both renewed and increased. Now that millage is on the longest possible time frame at the highest, almost the highest possible amount we can leverage. And that helps us because without that, we have to take money out of the general fund budget to pay special education costs. We already talked about the reimbursement process. In May of 2018, and this does not affect this year's budget that we're looking at tonight, uh, the 2017-18 audit, but it will impact 2018-19. So we're very excited that we received the support of our community to renew the operating millage. Mr. Demetrio will share with you that's about a $2 million plus for us uh, in this current year that we're sitting in <laughs> right now. Um, over the five years, we have continued to increase student enrollment. That is the way, one of the only ways that the state gives us to improve uh, our, our revenues. We have also lobbied at the state level for 31A at-risk dollars. Those dollars help to cover um, people like our reading interventionists and other support staff that we need. For many years, Ann Arbor did not receive at-risk dollars to follow our students impacted by poverty. In the case that we made at the state, I can't believe we finally convinced them but the case we made was that in Ann Arbor, we have over 4,000 students impacted by poverty. That's more poor students than are in all of our surrounding districts in the county combined. And yet our poor students were not receiving the at-risk dollars. So now they are, that began last year in 2017-18, and it, con it continues this year. Um, very good. We have continued to increase enrollment, and yet we continue to increase enrollment from within the district. Approximately 94% of all of our district enrollment comes from inside the Ann Arbor Public Schools boundaries. We've heard this evening about the increase in costs from teachers, and I certainly hear that and understand it at the employee level. And we also have increased costs at the district level. First of all, I want to just point out, if you look back at 2013, this is on the website, so don't worry if you can't really read it, but we were um, five years ago on a very short timeline with all of our millages, and they weren't all at their maximum level. We have fundamentally worked and I appreciate the leadership of the board to vote yes when I've asked, because I know you're tired and weary of asking the public to support us, and yet it's the only way. And so all of these millages listed have been renewed, restored, and they all push out to about 2025. When I came, they were very, very short, and we were in trouble on that uh, on that account. This is a lot of what allows us to operate our district. Unfortunately, we are prevented by law from lobbying for day-to-day -day operating dollars. So we're not allowed to levy for that uh, as a local school district, but we can levy for lots of other things. As we look at our total amount on salary and benefits, and you'll see in a few moments in the audit report that the salaries and benefits are around 85% of the entire $255 million budget. So most every dollar, education is a people-rich endeavor. It takes lots of folks to get this work done, and uh, it is the majority of our budget. You can see how uh, over three years, uh, we've increased our costs on the district side about 22%, and then we'll back it out for a five-year trend, and that is about 27% increase. 
Um, and uh, in our committee meeting on Monday, the trustees made an interesting point is um, even if we weren't able to give an increase in salary, that number still goes up because the cost of retirement and insurance um, does continue to increase right now. Average retirement cost on top of the salary for each and every employee in the district averages 39%. 39% on top of the salary amount. And you'll see in the audit how that number has increased, again, in a state that's not properly supporting our retirement and um, in education. Our priority of staff compensation. We do have to ask ourselves, we made the priority of ensuring that our teachers and staff were among the most competent, caring and committed and competitively paid. How are we doing on that goal? We want to do more. We always want to do more. And yet, how are we doing? While certainly um, we want to do more and we'll continue to do more as we can, uh, right now I want you to see where we are on the rankings. In Arbor Public School, according to the Michigan Department of Education, is ranked fourth in the 830 districts. Now, don't let that 830 blow your mind because remember, only about 550, Marios, are traditional school districts. The other almost 300 are charter, uh, charter schools that count. Uh, the second look at this is how are we doing in Washtenaw County? And you can see there, and we look at this every year, sitting down with our EA team, look at it for beginning teachers, look at it for mid-range teachers, look at it for top uh, level teachers that you see where we are in the county. Now this is average teacher salary. I know that's an imperfect measure, I get that, and yet it's the measure that we have. And then uh, when you think to yourself, well who are those top 10 districts in the state? I thought it would be worth it just to take a look at the size of those districts, and you can see there we are fourth um, and this, by the way, is based on 2016-17 because the state is always about a year and a half behind in terms of publishing this data. And the last look is where we are in the states. Michigan, as I've already shared with you, is not where we want them to be, down at 13. And yet if we take Ann Arbor, we can see how that fits into the picture. It's not where it needs to be. We say that all the time. Um, our truth and reality of where we are, one metric that we look at is the days of operation that we could go with our fund balance as it currently is. And so this metric, you'll hear the auditor speak to it in a few minutes, says if our revenue stopped tomorrow, how many days could we operate the district? It's not, a rea it's not a reality, and we certainly hope that never happens. It's just one way to get at the health of the district. And you can see that over the years 10, 11, and 12, and it's true if you go farther back, we regularly had about 45 days of operating in our fund equity. You can see where we are in those early years um, uh, when we were cutting and some of the trustees are experienced. You lived through those years uh, where we got down as low as 17 days. Um, and here we are tonight, you will see, at 26 days of operation. And so I've asked Mr. Dimitriou to speak for just a few minutes to the foundation. Because so many people drive through our town and they see our housing values and our rent amounts and people think that we, the district, are getting all of those taxes. And yet, the way that Michigan funding works in Arbor Public Schools is a donor district. And so we probably won't have time to go through all that tonight. But one metric is how much are we funded for each enrolled student? And I'm, I'm asking Mr. Dimitro to look at that and then to also look at inflation. And then we'll wrap up 
and move right into our auditors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swift, and good evening, uh, Board of Education. So um, I, we're looking at our foundation allowance, and um, currently <clears throat> for this year, 1819, it's at $9,410. And the last time that we were close to that figure was in 2005, 2006. There's only a dollar difference between those 13 years, how much we get paid now uh, for our students. So uh, calculating inflation between that time and now, it's approximately 25, 26%. But compounding this, because there's the power of, is 28.75%. So taking that 9,409, adding the inflation to it, just to pay for keep up with inflation, um, that brings that number to 12,114. That is how much we should have been getting or this year in order for us just to keep up with inflation, which if you divide those 13 years into 28.75, it's just a little bit more than 2% a year, which is not that much. So that difference between what we actually get, the 9410, and what we should be getting is 2704. So based on our enrollment, the 17,935, the amount of money that we're not getting this year, that we should be getting just to keep up with inflation, is 48 million and a half. Just for 28, 18, 19, just for this year. And you don't have a compounded number or a cumulative number for that? I do. It's over 200 million. Yeah. I believe the next slide that we wanted to make you aware, some of the policies that a state has that has to do with the 2x formula, where districts, what the state is trying to do is to basically the districts that are a little bit more high funded to lower them down or keep them at the same place while they're giving more money to the districts that are lower funded to bring them up, which means a district like ours where a community has, is investing in the school district um, is not funded from the state. So what happens, for example, this year most of the school districts got $240 more per student. We got 120, so we get half. By instituting this policy, it is the rate of inflation this year is approximately 25 percent, um, and our increase is close to one percent. So you already see how how this plays out. So a lot of the school districts, because they're getting twice as much as we're getting, you can see their fine balances are starting to go up. This is the statewide fund balances, and you can see that is approximately 12%, uh, a little bit probably more than 12%, that the last numbers that are available, 2017, and you can see that um, since, you know, this 2X formula since the last three years have made a difference in a lot of school districts, um, but we get half that and we can't even keep up with inflation. So let's just highlight our challenges and our next steps, and then we'll bring our auditors forward. Uh, you just heard from Mr. Dimitro, our, our critical challenge is underfunding at the state level. The fact that our per pupil foundation is, is $1 more than it was 13 years ago is a reality that our legislature in Michigan should be ashamed of. I said at the beginning, every budget tells a story. Every budget reveals our priorities. And I promise everyone in this room and everyone in our community, I will not hold silent until we get this funding mechanism correct in Michigan. Because what this says is that we do not value our children in the state of Michigan, we do not value our education, educators, 
and public education. Public education is the cornerstone of our democracy. It is for each and every child on every day of school, and we cannot do that without appropriate funding. The second challenge, and this is intentional from the legislature, is that we've been prevented by law from levying for local operating dollars. So uh, while they would say to you it's a way to achieve equity, I would say it's a way to ensure that everyone's moving downward uh, on, on the level of funding in local districts. Thirdly, uh, our challenge is that continued escalation in retirement and health care costs. Education is not alone. alone. This is true in every uh, uh, corporation, in every public organization. That third challenge is common across all. And then fourth, uh, Mr. Demetrio gave a presentation on this just a few weeks ago. If you haven't seen it, I would invite you to go on and watch it. Um, but the continued raid of K-12 uh, school aid fund, and that's been going on uh, under this uh, current governor. And uh, the number now is in the billions of dollars that have been taken out of the school aid fund in Michigan. <laughs> it's being used to support things we all believe in, junior colleges, higher ed, these endeavors are endeavors we believe in, and yet we're using K-12 public education. We're balancing the state of Michigan's budget on the backs of our K-12 children and on the backs of our educators, and it is not right. And so those are our challenges. Let's look at our next steps. We're going to hear the audit this evening. We continue to monitor the budget every day. Tonight, Mr. Demetrio, after the, after the audit, will present the October budget monthly monitoring report because we sit together, trustees, every month and scour the budget to see what's going on each month. So we will continue to vigilantly monitor and we will continue to innovate. Um, we did a wonderful thing on November 6, 2018, and that is to elect a Democratic governor in Michigan. And I believe that our possibilities are better. We all know that her reality is that she works with the Republican legislature. So we're going to have to continue to advocate at the state level to make the case and tell the story of quality public education. Our children cannot do well if their education is not funded well. We know that we're better, we're stronger when we work together. We will continue on this path. We didn't start today, we're not finished today, but our commitment runs deep our passion around providing for children and the beautiful teachers who teach them is uh, something we all believe in and we're gonna to continue to work on. And so with that, I invite Mr. Demetrio, Ms. Laura Clays, Ms. Jennifer Chambers from Plant Moran to come and they're going to walk you through the presentation of the audit. All of this will be up on board docs and Mr. Cluley, you'll make sure that it gets up on the front page of the website at least by tomorrow. I know we don't have our webmaster here uh, this evening. Um, so um, trustees, if you did not bring back your federal grants book and your other books, um, I know you love those books, um, there are extra copies in the middle of each of your tables. Um, and we're happy for you to share those. Uh, this is the document, however, that Ms. Clays and Ms. Chambers will be working from. And so with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Ms. Jennifer Chambers. Thank you, Dr. Swift. Thank you, Board of Education, for having us here tonight. Uh, some of the results of the audit and some of the metrics that we're going to talk about have been discussed in some of the, the board reports as well as Dr. Swift's comments. Um, but our presentation tonight is also intended to provide additional context and information around um, what was noted in the June 30, 2018 financial statement audit. It's important to remember that all school districts in the state of Michigan are required by law to have an audit. As a result of our audits that we performed, we have rendered an unmodified or clean opinion on the financial statements as well as the federal awards reports. 
Our audit of the federal programs had no findings or question costs, which is what a reader of the financial statements would be looking for as it relates to federal program operations. This is impressive given the $10.6 million of federal funding and programs that we tested. Um, they were found to be in compliance with federal regulations. This is becoming increasingly more complex um, as the federal reg regulations continue to change each year. Um, I do want to echo comments made earlier by Dr. Swift and thank you, thanking Ms. Matheson, Mr. Demetrio, as well as the business office and other district staff that we had to work with during the course of our audit. It's very much appreciated when they help facilitate that process and, and make it um, as responsive and as smooth as, as possible as we go through that. Before we get into the financial statement figures, we thought it would be helpful just to provide some overview highlights and challenges that the, that the district is currently experiencing. Um, as it relates to highlights, um, as it was noted already, enrollment has continued to grow um, for a number of years. And the district is continuing its investment in the classroom. Um, particularly this year, we noted adding reading interventionists um, to su support the early literacy uh, changes and the, the focus on third grade reading. Um, beyond that, uh, there's also been significant investments made in the infrastructure for the district um, with the community support of the technology bond, the 2015 bond funds, as well as the sinking funds. Uh, there's been, you know, collectively over $30 million just this past year of infrastructure improvements in technology and, and so forth um, that really provide uh, the buildings and, and all of um, the different resources for, for the students and staff uh, to be part of. Um, we've also noted that there is uh, continued expansion in the community um, that pairs along with the enrollment growth that has been noted, and um, so the district continues to be responsive to that. So along with these highlights come some challenges, and some of those were, were noted in some of the introductory comments. Uh, the district is continually balancing priorities, um, looking at uh, student and classroom supports and um, just evaluating different programs to be offered. In addition to that, balancing the priority of making investments in staff to be able to attract and retain uh, individuals here in the district. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, despite those sizable capital investments that have been made, um, though the, the funds will be limited, you know, the bond funds will be spent, and so it's important to just know that that investment in the infrastructure uh, also needs to be continued and evaluated as you look to make decisions going forward. So now we can get into some of the financial statement figures themselves. The first numerical slide we have here shows general fund revenue and expenditures. It shows the original approved budget from May of 2017, the amended final budget in May of 18, as well as the actual audited results. First, looking at the left-hand side of the graph, this shows general fund revenue. The district originally budgeted for revenue of $235.4 million. And then in May of 2018, with the final amended budget, expected $253.7 million. The actual results of revenue are 254.6 million, so very close to what was budgeted. Um, it's important to note that we have it shaded on both the left-hand side and the right-hand sides of the graph, the $17.5 million um, that's kind of in the, in the hash marks. Um, this represents additional funding that the state of Michigan provides for the retirement system. This comes through by way of a categorical on your state aid report it's referred to as the Section 147C funds. It's important to note this on the revenue side because you do get that as additional revenue, but because it is currently structured as a categorical, that could be removed from, from your funding. Um, when we talk about expenditures, you'll note that that, that also is you know, noted in terms of what the impact would be, but in the absence of this revenue, those expenditures would remain. So it's just important to keep that in mind as, as we're looking at the revenues and expenditures throughout. <coughs> As we move to the right-hand side of the graph, we'll look at expenditures. The district originally budgeted for $234.3 million of expenditures, and then in May of 2018, increased that to $255.6 million. The actual results came in at about $256.2 million. And we have some additional slides later on in the presentation that will get into the different components of revenue and expenditures so we can better understand the different sources and uses. 
On the next graph, we're continuing to look at the general fund budget versus actual results and, and really what the net impact is to fund balance. So if you start at the left-hand side, we start with the fund balance as of June 30, 2017, which was $19.9 million. We talked about what the uh, budgeted and the actual revenue and expenditures were, and what that does is it gets you then down to what the, the net result was or the net change in fund balance. The district had, with its final amended budget, had planned to utilize fund balance of about $1.9 million. The actual utilization of fund balance came in at about $1.5 million. And in relative terms, you know, we, we have the dollar variances in, the, in the, the right hand columns, as well as the percentage variances. And I think it's important to point out the percentage variance um, with revenue being at 0.36 and expenditures at 0.25%. Um, you know, if, if you were looking at that in, in relative terms for $100, that would mean that the budget differed by 36 cents for revenue or 25 cents for expenditures. So, so that, that, that's a very, uh, precise uh, variance, if you will. Um, and from a, a legality perspective, the district is not allowed to expend more than it's budgeted for um, based on the stipulations of the state. <coughs> um, of particular interest is at the bottom of the slide, and I think some of these numbers were mentioned earlier as well. Um, sometimes it's helpful to put fund balance in, in context in terms of um, percentages of expenditures or percentages of revenue. Um, as these are some common metrics that are looked at, um, you know, as when the state's evaluating uh, district health, if you will. So um, the fund balance as a percentage of expenditures is 7.2% this year. And that's also the same for the fund balance as a percentage of revenue. The reason that we're uh, highlighting the percentage of revenue is because um, this is the measure tied to the early warning legislation that the, the state has put in place. Uh, the, the state implemented this legislation that indicated that if a district falls below 5% of revenue, then um, you are essentially subjected to additional reporting and additional monitoring then at that point by the state. You kind of are, are on, on a list that they, they begin to watch districts in, in that range. Um, we've also equated the fund balance to days of operation. Um, this metric is helpful when you're looking at large dollars, you're managing a large expenditure dollars, a large district here. And so trying, again, to just put fund balance in perspective. And it was described earlier by Dr. Swift in terms of thinking about if, if the district were to not, not have any revenue sources, um, what would the fund balance allow you to have? And, and this year, um, the, the days of operation that you could continue on in the absence of that revenue would be 26 days. Um, when you're thinking about fund balance, and we've got a couple of different slides that also continue to look at fund balance, um, one of the primary areas that, that fund balance comes into play is really when you're thinking about cash flow management. Um, and it's just important to, to remind that uh, there's a, a couple of months during the year in July and August where school districts do not receive state aid money. Um, and, and we'll show you in a little bit the importance of your state revenue. And so uh, the fund balance can, can assist in managing uh, the cash flow needs of the district during that time. Um, we felt it was important to reflect historically the fund balance for the district so you can have some perspective on how things have been changing over time. Um, you can see here how the, the fund balance has changed over the years to where it rests today on the far right hand side of $18.4 million. Um, over the past few years, there has been a utilization of fund balance. And while it is stronger, much stronger than it was in 2013 and 2014, um, it is important to continue to monitor this closely. At the bottom of the slide, we have the historical percentage of expenditures figure. Um, I mentioned the 7.2%, which is where the, the current year is. Um, but then for perspective, we've provided uh, those historical numbers so you have that for reference as well. So the, the next graph here, again, continues to try to provide some additional context as it relates to fund balance and, and really to provide you some different indicators and connect it to what, what your expenditure budget is um, when thinking about what's an appropriate level um, or assessing what the level of fund balance is when, when you're making, making plans. 
so I'll kind of walk you through what the, what the different components are here. Um, there's really four primary data points presented. Um, the first part here in the, the green section, um, so this would be the amount of fund balance that would be the 5% of revenue measure that I talked about a couple of slides ago. Um, where that would be if we're utilizing the 2018 um, revenues and expenditure numbers, um, if, the, if the fund balance were at 12.7 million, that would be at that 5% early warning line, if you will. If you go up to the next bar, um, this then takes us up to what the June 30, 2018 actual fund balance is for the district, and we mentioned that that percentage is 7.2%, again, or the 18.4 million. If we look at then the orange section, this, this then provides you what the level of fund balance would need to be in order to be at the statewide average percentage. And, and that uh, was talked a little about a little bit earlier by Mr. Demetrio. He mentioned that this is at 12.79%. Um, that is for the 16-17 school year because that's the latest data that has been accumulated by the state. But essentially, Ann Arbor would need to be at about $32.8 million of fund balance in order to be at that 12.79% level. And then the last level we have here is the 15% level. Uh, the 15% level is sometimes uh, discussed in state associations such as MSBO as a possible recommended fund balance level. And so in order to achieve that level, the district would need to have about $38.4 million of fund balance. The next graph that we have is uh, presenting the last five years of the net changes in fund balance uh, for the general fund. Um, and so this is not a cumulative um, graph. This is to show you in each individual single year um, what was either the addition or the utilization of fund balance. Uh, in the four recent years, um, and it was uh, mentioned in the introductory comments as well, uh, there has been significant one-time funding sources and significant one-time uses um, that has played a role in the changes in fund balance. Um, the details are provided here at the bottom of, of the graph, and again, we're also provided um, with some context at the beginning of the presentation. It was also noted that in 2018, the district did receive several one-time sources of local revenue, um, such as the cell phone tower leases, the easement that was mentioned, and, and those uh, prior year uh, tax base adjustments as well. So now that we've covered kind of the overall impact of fund balance, giving you some historical perspective, now we'll start to get into some of the specifics of um, revenue, and then um, I'll turn it over to Laura to talk about uh, the expenditure side. So here we're looking at general fund revenue and uh, highlighting what uh, the primary sources of revenue is for the district. I mentioned earlier that total revenue is about $254.6 million. And of that number, about 67% does come from the state or from your foundation allowance. As you are aware, the foundation allowance, this number is really made up of two main components. Um, first is your enrollment. And then second is the per pupil foundation allowance number um, that is multiplied by enrollment to get you that. And what this graph really highlights, and, and it kind of echoes what the, the theme has been, is that the, the district and all districts in the state of Michigan are highly dependent on the revenue that's received from the state. Um, and this just kind of further illustrates that. About 15% of the revenue, or shown in the purple pie section, is received from a variety of sources such as state categorical revenues, special education funding, and parking fees and some other local revenue. There's about 12% of your revenue that's received for, uh, from the county for, for special education. And then we've highlighted the $17.5 million of the MIPSERS pass-through funding that I talked about at the very beginning, um, just to show you really the impact of um, that on the total revenue. So that's about 7% right now of, of the current revenue that's received. The next graph takes a look at the foundation allowance, um, really going all the way back to 2005, 2006. Um, Mr. Demetrio covered uh, kind of what it was then and what it is now. And I think what this graph provides is kind of what happened in between. 
And what you can see is that, you know, your state funding has really uh, been uh, impacted very significantly over the years. Um, at the early part of the graph, you can see that uh, you were at the highest funding at that point in time. Um, in 2008-2009, um, just over $9,700 per pupil. And as you go through then the, the history after that, um, you know, in, in 2011, 2012, 13, those were when districts were really experiencing very significant cuts um, across the state uh, in terms of the amount per pupil that, that uh, districts were receiving the lowest level being just over $9,000 a pupil. You know, fast forward now to where we are projected for 1819 school year, so the one you're operating in right now, um, it was mentioned that $9,410 per pupil will be what is, is going to be received. And that is virtually then the same as what was received in 2005, 2006. So over this span of time with all of these changes, you're only now where you were back in 2005. Um, and so it just paints the picture of how, how drastic some of these changes have, have really impacted you. The next graph we have is uh, related to student enrollment. So this, this slide goes back to 2009, 2010, and again, just provides a historical perspective of what the student enrollment has been over time and as well shows the 2018-19 um, anticipated or estimated based on the fall 2018 count. Um, you know, it really should be noted that um, these types of uh, enrollment increases are, are, are fairly rare here in the state. Um, you are, are one uh, amongst only a few who've experienced such significant increases in both percentages and actual numbers of, of an enrollment increase. And so I think that really just speaks to your ability to attract and provide quality programming that brings and, and keeps the students here. Um, you can see that in, in the enrollment growth that's presented. At this point, I'll turn it over to Laura. She's going to go through the expenditure side. Thank you, Jennifer. Good evening. Uh, so as Jennifer mentioned, she went through the revenues. I'll talk about the expenditures. So the first slide that we see here talks about the total general fund expenditures for the year ended June 30, 2018, and that total was $256.2 million. As you can see, $194.9 million was spent on salaries and benefits, or 76% of the total. And that's what you would expect to see in an organization such as a school district. Their people costs, that's where you're investing the dollars. And we'll talk a little bit further about where those dollars are invested as I move through further slides. The other piece that's important to look at is that green uh, component, which is the same as the one that Jennifer talked about earlier. That's that $17.5 million of the receipt of cash that you get from the state for the retirement funding. And then you turn right around and write a check to the state for that exact amount. So we want you to know that that's there and that is certainly an expenditure. And then the other large components you can see in red would be purchase services. So that would be custodial and maintenance, transportation, technology, utilities, those costs that you're paying a vendor to provide. And then supplies and materials make up the other largest component of $7.6 million. What you don't see on this slide, which we see in many other districts, is a component related to capital outlay or capital expenditures. And the reason that you don't see that here are the comments that Jennifer made in the beginning. With the support from the community for the sinking fund and the bond issues that you have, those capital expenditures are paid for with those dollars and they're not coming out of the general fund, which is a challenge that we see faced in some other local school districts. So that's something that's a collaborative effort within the community and having that support really does help in this picture here. So as I said before, the salary and benefits were $194.9 million, plus we have that additional $17.5 million that's going to the state for the retirement pass-through. When you add those together, that's about $212 million. I'm gonna take a look just at that component, the $212 million of salaries and benefits, and that agrees to the dollar amount that Dr. Swift mentioned in her opening comments. So this is where we're gonna look at how those dollars are spent. So the $212.4 million of that amount, 126.8 is spent on salaries and wages. So that's going into the payroll costs that go to the employees of the district, or 59.7%. Then the next largest component, as you would expect based on some of the comments that we've talked about in the past, would be the retirement contribution. So the total retirement contribution that the school district makes, exclusive of the amounts that are coming out of individuals' paychecks, is $49.6 million, or 23% of the total. 
17 and a half, yes, is a pass-through, but as we mentioned before, that is the actual cost. You are required to pay that amount regardless of whether the state gives you any additional funding for it. So those would be the biggest components. And then as you would expect, the next largest component is health insurance at $23.2 million. And again, this is the district cost, not the amount that's coming out of the employees' paychecks. And we're going to delve into that a little bit deeper in just a moment. So if you focus on that salary and benefit number, $212.4 million, and now we say, where did that actually get spent? On what individuals and in what departments throughout the district? So that 2124 of, of that amount, 95% of that is spent on school-based salaries and benefits. And what I mean by that is we go through, and part of our audit process is we look at how those dollars are categorized, and you're required, just like every school district in Michigan, to report those in a certain manner, and that helps the state do comparisons amongst districts. So when we look at those categories, 87.8% .8 is spent on instruction and instructional support. So individuals that are having that classroom impact or having support of the classroom events. The other large component, or $15.4 million, is the school building administration. So people that are in the building having an impact on that student's experience. Those two components together make up that 95% that I mentioned. Then we have about $3.2 million spent on central administration. $1.6 million spent on operations and facilities, and then $5.8 million on other categories, and we've listed a couple of the examples there on the slide. But the overwhelming majority, as you would expect and has been talked about, is invested in the school-based services that are affecting the students. So let's talk a little bit more about that retirement cost that I mentioned earlier. As you can see, we've, do, we've talked about this in the past. We're really looking at a trend on the expenditure in terms of what's happened with retirement funding, and then I'll talk a minute uh, about what's going to happen in the future. So back in 2010 or 11, the district spent about $22.4 million on retirement. And then you can see as we move to the right, that's grown ex more expensive each and every year. So for the year ended June 30, 2018, it's that $49.6 million that I talked about. What's important to note, though, is you can see that light blue piece that's on each of those bars starting in the 2013 fiscal year. That's when the state started providing some of that supplemental funding that then you had to turn around and pay back. And what you can see happening is those dollars have continued to grow. And the reason is the funding or the underfunding of that retirement system continues because there are more people drawing on the system right now than is coming in. People are living longer. The investments that you have no control over are maybe performing well, maybe not in a given year, and all of that affects the contribution rate. So you don't have a choice to participate. You cannot choose how those dollars are invested. You can't say, I can't make a payment. Those are things that you're required to do because that is legislated by state. And so you can see that we included the dollar amounts that the state provided as funding in each of the years beginning in 2013. As was mentioned before, for every dollar of payroll cost that's made by the district, an additional 39% is then contributed into the system. So when we look at projections going forward that come from the state, when will this stop? When will these rates start to drop? It's going to stay at about that level for at least the next probably 15 years. They're projecting out 2039, so that's even further out. A lot of that is impacted by how investments perform and all the mortality rates that they look at, but we know those mortality tables are changing, and I'm guessing people are living longer. That's what we see in our own families, and so that has an impact on how long people draw upon the system. So we'll continue to report this out to you, and we'll provide information as will Mr. Demetrio as it becomes available. The other key component that we talked about from salary and benefits perspective is health care costs. So let's look again at what's happening there. And as I mentioned, this is really just the district's component of that. And so those health care costs, they've remained relatively consistent when we look in that middle component of 14, 15, and 16, right about that $20 million level. And then the last couple of years, they've ticked up. And this most recent year for June 30, 2018, it's at $23.7 million, which is up about $1.2 million, or 5%. And we did have a little footnote here on the bottom that talks about the district currently pays under the hard cap scenario. They pay a maximum of $13,219 per teacher. And, and the reason I put that there, that's the largest employee group. 
it's paid for every group at that cap. That's the number. But it is a cost, and that was an increase of $289 from the previous fiscal year. Again, that cap gets set every year by the state. They send you a memo and they say, here's the new cap, and then you have to decide how that gets paid by the district. And right now, you're paying at that cap amount. So we'll continue to monitor that. Certainly, if you talk to other individuals that maybe are working in a corporate environment, health care costs have continued to increase for them as well, maybe at an increased pace. But this is the component that you're dealing with and that you have to figure out how to allocate resources toward. So I want to just spend a minute on this graph, and this is one that Jennifer already talked about. It's really just bringing everything back together. So again, looking at that cumulative fund balance, what's happened over time. For the year ended June of 2018, you ended the year with $18.4 million worth of fund balance. But I think what's important is that percentage of expenditures, the 7.2%. When President Stead made her comments, they talked about the fact that when they adopted that last budget with the um, contract negotiations and the settlements in there, the expected fund balance at that point in time was 7.41%. When Jennifer talked about the budget that was adapted, there was an expected utilization of fund balance. So the key there is to, there's no surprises in what happened. Those numbers were known. The key is trying to manage it for the future because the state does look at that fund balance as a percentage of expenditures. They look at it as a percentage of revenue. <laughs> and what they really don't want to have to do is what they've had to do with some other districts when they've been in distress. So you want to be in charge of your own destiny for as long as you can. You're doing a great job in that regard. But it's our job to kind of tell you, here's some things to kind of look out for. And so that's what we've got on the next thing. So key takeaways, as we've talked about before, the success the district has is always going to be a collaboration between the community, between the district, between being transparent and talking about what's going on and making the best decisions that you can with the things that you can control. We're really proud to tell you, and you already know this, for the fifth year in a row, your enrollment has increased. So for the June 30, 2019 year, right now the student enrollment is up by 206 students. So when you multiply that times that $9,410 foundation allowance, that will generate an additional $1.75 million worth of revenue for the district. And it's up to you to decide how those resources get deployed. What we've seen and talked about before is that the students are coming to the district and they're staying here because of the programming decisions that you're offering. And we just encourage you to continue to have those conversations and we know that you will. But we wouldn't be good auditors or accountants if we also didn't say on the cost side of the equation. Just make sure that you're monitoring those costs and being as efficient as you can with those dollars. The reason being, when Jennifer talked about those annual changes in your fund balance, a lot of those changes are being driven by one-time revenue sources. And as Dr. Swift mentioned, it's really hard to have one-time revenue coming in and then making the decision to spend that on recurring costs because you want to make sure that those costs, once you put them in place, you're able to always afford them. So what should you be paying attention to in the school environment? So we've listed a number of different items here. We've talked about many of these in the past. So just a few highlights. One is keeping a look at your cash flow needs and the fund balance levels. It's very important that you continue to have a healthy fund balance because the district is intended to be here for the long term. So you are stewards of those dollars today to make sure that those dollars are there for the future. So continuing to watch that is important because you don't want to have someone else coming in and telling you how you're going to spend your money and make decisions for you. Secondly, as Jennifer mentioned, you are highly dependent upon the state, just like everyone else is in the state of Michigan. So paying attention to what's going on at the state level, making sure that the state hears the concerns that you have, especially with the new uh, legislature and a new governor coming in, I think those things will be extremely important. But it does have an impact, and you need to watch those retirement contribution rates and what's happening with health care costs. And just recognizing any of those changes all have a significant impact on the funding for the district and the fund balance for the future. So what would we tell you to do? Continue to advocate at the state level as you have. Um, it was very helpful to me to sit and listen to the public comments because we spend all of our time looking at the numbers, of course. But when you tell those personal stories, especially at the state level, those resonate 
I can talk to them all day long about numbers. They're just numbers. When they hear the stories that go with it, it does make them think about how can they make some changes. Whether they can get them passed or not is another story, but they do take those things to heart. So continue to share that information. Monitor the monthly budget reports. I know that's coming up when we're done here. Um, making sure that you know how you're paying people. Is it competitive? Are, and I appreciate that you're watching that and seeing where you're at in the state, and that helps you to make some decisions along the way. And always continuing to balance long-term investments with what you need today, recognizing that this is a long-term uh, investment that you're making in the lives of those students currently and to come. And it, we've already talked about the one-time only items, so I won't eat that up anymore. So with that, we are all set with our presentation. We'd be happy to take any questions that you have, um, or certainly if there are closing comments by any of the board members or the superintendent. I wanted to summarize a couple things and, and also look ahead a little bit for next year. Um, but one of them was just to reiterate, and we've shared some of these numbers tonight, but I think it's good to put it into context, what does it mean to be a donor district that Dr. Swift talked about. One of the things we heard was that our tax base revenue increased last year by 5.5%. That's fairly healthy. So we should expect 5.5% of an increase back to Ann Arbor, right? That would be nice. This uh, times the 25 years that Proposal A has been law since 1994. This cumulatively has led to an effect where 70% of what's raised here does not come back here. That's what we mean when we say we're a donor district. So we got a 1.29% increase on our foundation allowance from last year versus the 5.5% that was increased based on taxable property value from our community, our district boundaries. So that other increase, that four some percent, went anywhere but back in our community. And that happens every single year. Our fund equity, to talk a little bit more about, uh, I want to reiterate Trustee Lightfoot's point around why did we invest the way we did? We invested two years in a row. And, the, and you, if you look at one of the slides, that, and I love that you put the fund equity at the bottom, because you can see in 2016 that our fund equity was 10.2%. That gave this board a lot of confidence that year to approve a first round of salary increases that we haven't been able to do for a long time. And we were happy to be able to do that. And that was not as big a number as we were able to do the next year. But because we had seen a 10.2% fund equity balance end up at the end of 2016, that gave us a lot of confidence that we had some strength to draw on. <laughs> so our very next year, the fund, uh, the fund equity was 8.5%. At the time, we were projecting 9.5%. But we had seen strong student enrollment growth. We had used some one-time things. But we had still some confidence and some strength that gave us the ability to, to say with confidence, we want to invest in our teachers and staff. And so we did. What that cost us, however, is about uh, $7 million. And that will cost us again this year, because we're not reducing salaries and going back to what we had before. Instead, we're staying where we are. And that's another $7 million we need to find this year. So that $120 we got per student uh, and as an increase in our student enrollment, if you take that number and multiply it by our student enrollment, that gives us $2,125,000. That's not $7 million. So we have a $5 million delta again this year to close just to stay the course with the raises that are in place right now. The other thing that we would note, and Dr. Swift talked about this a little earlier, this board budgeted June in 2018 for enrollment growth of 240 students. Yet again, two years in a row, we did get student enrollment growth, and we're proud of that. But we did not get what we budgeted. So we're off by another 40 students. Now, if we were in the 20, you can see those years, that was fun. 2012, 2013, 2014, that would make us have immediate cuts in operations. 
we're not quite in that situation, but we're also not quite in a situation where we're covering what we thought we would be covering through student growth. So we have a delta here that's, that's, um, that we need to address somehow. Um, we also invested, rightfully so, in what I hope is the most aggressive and most effective lead mitigation program for drinking water um, in this country. And I hope it yields us getting to zero parts per billion because that's what our kids deserve. So I'm proud of that work. But it's an example of the kinds of things, like an Allen Elementary flood, uh, that happen. And where we have 32 buildings and about 4 million square foot of space, um, and 18,000 children were taken care of. We need some capacity to handle those kinds of things. Um, even though we're not near the 15%, it, um, it's a, still a worthy goal to, to get closer to that versus closer to the 5%. And then the, we have less and less one-time tools in our, our toolkit that we can call on. We sold our interest in the library space that we had for our board meetings. Um, we can't resell that again. We sold Roberto Clemente. We can't resell that again. Um, all of these one-time things that we've sold, the easement property last year, um, we don't have those again to sell. So we're going to have to dig a little deeper as we look ahead. Um, and then the other context is having a, a democratic governor is nice. But it's not going to be easy to put $4.5 billion back into K-12 public education when we're now 100% funding community colleges with those dollars, 35% funding universities with those dollars, and the other 40 things you showed us one day, Mario, on a slide, that all look like good things that we should be funding. So those won't be easily cut by certainly not a Democratic governor. Um, so we're, we're going to be at this for a while, folks. We are going to be at this for a while um, before things turn around. And it's going to get more difficult, I would suggest, um, to us. So we will need the full help of our community. Um, we'll need the full help of, of a board to look out for, and especially look out for. We heard tonight we'd like, we don't want to hire more teachers. But the role of these trustees is to especially look out for the students who don't vote, they don't write us. Our kindergartners aren't writing us. They don't show up at board meetings to complain. They're counting on us adults to look out for them and balance these many interests. So I appreciate Trustee Lightfoot saying, tell us. But the reality is that responsibility rests with the board to balance, ultimately, everyone's interests. Everyone would like more money. Um, and we would love to be able to continue to do that every year, and we will do that if we c at all can. But we're not going to, I hope this, that the new board will not do that at the expense of our children. Because they don't, they are counting on the adults in our community, especially the trustees, to look out for them and take the best care of them that they can. So that's just kind of wrapping up you know, where we ended up. Thank you so much for a wonderful, the, the work you do with us is amazing in the context. I, I always admire, especially coming from women auditors, that you do a lovely job putting together a very detailed and articulate picture. Um, no offense, Marios, but that, I just, <laughs> but you do a, a beautiful job providing that kind of context and the story that's so important about how we do our work. Um, and Marios, you, you and your team, and Dr. Swift especially, getting $8.1 million in funds that helped cover these kinds of things so we ended up where we did is no small task. And I just want to congratulate you and thank you. That's, um, I don't know that we will do that every single year, but our community sure is appreciative that we are in the situation we're at today and we'll continue to work together to try to find these things. Um, but we really appreciate how hard you all work to keep Ann Arbor Public Schools one of the very best districts in the state. So thank you.